there was a young boy who was adopted. And he dropped out of college, and he hung out with other strange geeks. And he went to India, became a Buddhist, shaved his head, came back to America, experimented with his psychedelic drugs. Now, are you parents and people who care for children, are, are you a little feeling the disappointment and pain that could be in this story? This young lad slept on the floors of friends, collected Coke bottles and tur turned them in for cash. He, he got all the free meals he could at the Hare Krishna temple. And most people thought that he would amount to not very much. But in 1976, at the age of 21, he founded Apple Computers. His goal was to make the computer accessible for everybody <coughs> and to make it really easy to use. Stephen Jobs and his team of West Coast countercultural hackers released their first Apple product. It was a personal computer kit. Some assembly required. It was not an instant success. However, during the last quarter of 2011, Apple sold over 20.3 million iPhones and 9.3 million iPads. They've revolutionized the way that we change the telephone, the way that we use the computer, the way that we use the, our, the way we listen to music, and even the way we uh, watch TV. In fact, when my husband Frank was traveling last week, he phoned me on my iPad and we did FaceTime. I could talk to him and look him straight in the eye. And when my nephew Tyler phones his parents to tell him how hot it is here in Maryland, <laughs> because they're still wearing sweaters in Calgary. At the same time he's on the phone, he can calculate the Fahrenheit temperature into Celsius, because in Canada the temperatures are in Celsius. And every time I have a question, every time I wonder why, he goes, Auntie, there's an app for that. <laughs> the kingdom of God is like Steve Jobs' Apple technology. It's begun in an unexpected and possibly disreputable source, and then it grows pervasively, disrupting our lives, even changing the way we think and the way we behave. We've gone from a rotary dial phone that sat in the kitchen or maybe in the hall, and the whole family shared the one phone. We've moved from that technology in our lives to, and, and computers, computers were as big as a table. We've moved from that technology to handheld gadgets that every kid can use. And most kids won't leave their bedroom without trying to stay connected to family and friends. But we're going to flash back about 2,000 years or more to a time when man had not even conceived the computer. And Christ is giving all these different examples, trying to teach us what the, he heaven of, the kingdom of heaven is like. There are five parables in this series that Tom read so well this morning. It takes a whole feast of parables to show us all the different facets of what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then Jesus gives them to us in pairs. Kingdom of heaven is like seeds, and the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, and the kingdom of heaven is like buried treasure, and the kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. These are male images and female images so that everybody can connect to what he's trying to say. And he uses these surprising thoughts that disrupt the way we normally think and, and yet we try and simplify the message. We try and break it down to a little bit of yeast makes the whole bread rise. But it's more than that. You've got to kind of climb in behind those one-liners to figure out what's going on. First of all, yeast didn't come in those little yellow packets. You know, it was, it, the, the housewives would make a batch of bread dough and then they would reserve one little piece of bread dough and they'd leave it out on their counter to ferment. Very much like this sourdough 
It just sat on the counter being stinky until the next time she wanted to bake another batch of bread. Everywhere else in the Bible, leaven is a symbol of moral and political corruption. So we see in Matt 16, Jesus says, Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, A little yeast ruins the whole batch. And he admonishes the people, saying, Keep the festival not with the old yeast of malice and wickedness, but with the bread of sincerity and truth, unleavened bread without yeast. Throughout the whole Hebrew Bible, it is unleavened bread that reminds the Jews of their Passover and stands as a symbol for sacrifice and service to God. Yet Jesus chooses this particular analogy. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast hidden in bread dough which ferments and changes an unbelievable amount of flour and bakes into a living bread that could feed over a hundred people. The kingdom of heaven sneaks into our everyday lives in hidden and unexpected ways, incorporating bubbles of God's love, stretching our structures, changing our systems, creating a new matrix based on God's plan. Jesus' words demonstrate this to us and his deeds too. God's plan changes the status quo. It requires more from us. We have to shift from our normal perspective of survival of the fittest or survival of the richest to survival for all, a place where everybody has enough. People resist this because it requires personal sacrifice for all of us to be at the table together. And the kingdom of God is present in part. It's a reality partly now, but for some, for some everything is unchanged and they're still waiting for a future unfolding. God's grand scheme remains hidden to them. Consider the achingly difficult news out of Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. The whole Horn of Africa has experienced the lowest rainfall in 60 years. Now nature has caused the drought, but mankind is exasperating the famine. Somalia in particular has been in civil unrest for a number of years, and the insurgents are blocking the relief food. <coughs> Families are walking for weeks and weeks to get to the refugee camps in Kenya. Mothers carrying their limp children like rag dolls are adopting other small children, orphans, sitting by the road by the bodies of their dead parents. For these skinny, dried up men and women, the promises of God must seem very hidden. The kingdom of God must seem like a distant and vague hope. And yet, the United Nations World Program remains committed to bringing food relief into the area, even though it's dangerous and risky. Even though 14 people have died trying to help, they're still going to continue their program. And other relief agencies like the World Church Services are helping with food and water in the refugee camps in Kenya. And the United Methodist Committee on Relief, which we all know is Encore, is planning a regional response, coordinating with the other services that are already there. And continents away, people in congregations like us are walking in crop walks, or making donations to organizations like UNICEF and UMCOR so that we can help. We can't go to Africa to help, but we can help making sure there's funds to share the world's food. We want to help those parents and those babies who haunt our heart after we've seen the wretchingly difficult images on the evening news. Yeast requires time to devour the carbohydrates in the bread. And it works invisibly, but it's very potent. It takes faith 
to believe that that little loaf of bread is going to rise. And it takes faith and time for God's plan to his blueprint to work in our everyday, ordinary lives in our world, and we particularly have a difficult time seeing it when it comes to events like that drought in Africa. What about your lives and my life, our lives right here in Severn? Where is God's love in there? Oh, I know where the pain is. Illnesses that drain all of our energy. <coughs> Broken marriages. Fractured families, shifting children back and forth between adults, people grieving job losses, middle-aged caregivers, sandwiched between trying to give care to their own children and giving care to their mom who's just had a stroke, and the death of a loved one, a beloved brother. These are just the stories that I personally have heard this week. And yet, if we listen deeply, if we look intently, we can also see the mustard seeds and the yeast bubbles, and we can see the treasures and the pearls of hope that motivate us to follow on to God's reign. I have seen photos of this congregation renovating and rejuvenating this whole space, and I've sensed the growing excitement and energy that we're going to put into renovating and rejuvenating the parsonage so that it is ready for a new mission. I've seen parents and grandparents who care enough about their grandchildren that they'll give them that structured environment, the extra tutoring, the extra food, whatever they need. I've heard of one person who found a job after only 10 weeks. I've seen neighbors network together so that that woman sandwiched between the two poles of caring could discover the nursing home options and the home care options that she could choose from. I've seen you sit with Mary and David in their grief. And I know that you are a praying church who anticipates God's plan working in your lives. The more I get to know this congregation, the more I see the parts of God's plan coming together. I don't think that God caused the droughts or the famines or any of our personal difficulties, but God can work in those stinky sourdough situations God's work might be hidden, and it might take time, but it's powerful, and it's ultimately, it's good. And that's why we say, God is good all, all the, the time. time, all the time, God, God is, is good. good. Before Stephen Jobs put together his own company and tried to sell his ideas for a personal computer to both Hewler, Packard, and Atari, the president of Atari told him, get out, you stink, and we're not going to buy your product. But Stephen Jobs just wanted to make a ding in the universe. And today he strives for excellence, urging others to be a yardstick of quality. Who would have thought that a small group of countercultural men and women could change the world? Oh, wait a minute, isn't that what we're all about? God's ways are not our ways. Jesus shows us that we can behave differently, resisting the status quo of our political and social economic systems as they are now. We can participate in God's plan and let that stinky sourdough ferment in our lives. We can follow God's plan, transformed and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we can make a difference in this world. Amen. Amen.